In this video, we're going to build a gauge using images and sprites in Arduino. Hey everyone, this is Matt with Learn Everything About Design. And in this video, we're going to carry on our gauge series. And by carry on, I mean we're going to continue to learn different ways that we can do essentially the same thing. Now, in the very first video, which was quite long, we did a basic introduction to graphics and drawing on a screen. Now, I'm using an M5 stack gray. You can use pretty much any display you want. It will change which libraries and how you call certain functions, but we'll get to that once we get into the code. So in that first video, again, we looked at the basics of drawing things on the screen. We looked at displaying text, in this case, uh, number, and then we looked at GPS. Now, in that original video, we built a pretty intricate gauge that filled up a bar as it went around an arc, and it displayed the speed in the center. So if you're interested in learning the very basics and getting started, I highly suggest that you start there. If you have some Arduino experience and you wanted to learn the basics of sprites, the second video we talked about drawing a gauge into a sprite and displaying the needle as a sprite composited on top of the other one. So that was our first sort of introduction into using sprites, and this was with the ESPI library. Now, you can download the ESPI library, or if you're using an M5 stack, it's already included in some version inside of the M5 stack library. So in this video, we actually have a subscriber that sent me some images. He's working on a gauge, essentially, and this is for a boat. He wants to display a handful of different gauges, a speedo, a tack, oil pressure, coolant temp, coolant pressure, and also has some icons, some warnings that'll pop up if things are sort of outside of the normal range. So we're not gonna cover and build out this entire speedometer, but we do wanna talk about some of the basics and how we would start something like this. So in this video, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be learning how to take an image, a PNG, a JPEG, a bitmap, and how to convert it into a CPP or C++ byte array, code that will tell us exactly what each pixel color needs to be. Now there are some nuances to this. There's a couple different applications and websites you can use to convert this. It has some images that are some issues with transparency that we'll talk about. But ultimately what we're gonna do is we're gonna take two images, the image of a gauge and the image of a needle. We're gonna composite them together in a sprite and we're gonna have it sweep around. We'll talk about all the aspects of that some benefits to doing it this way. Uh, it gives you a nicer look and also some things that we should watch out for. So to get started, we are not gonna be hopping right into Arduino, but instead we need to talk about the process of converting those images. Now in the description of the video, there are a couple of links. Uh, the first one is the image to CPP. Now this is in a web browser, but you can actually download this and use it offline if you want and it should still work fine. Now, this is a great tool and it works pretty well. It has some different options that you can play around with. You can do things like uh, scale and rotate the image, which can be pretty helpful. Now, there are issues when you're scaling pixels. Uh, you generally don't wanna go to somewhere in the middle. So for example, if you had something that was 100 by 100, you would wanna scale it up 100%, 200%, 300%, and so on to ensure that the distribution of the pixels is the same. If you scale it up 125%, well then it messes with things like the distribution of the pixels, the pivot points and so on. So we're not gonna get into all that. We're gonna use them as the size that they're, uh, they're, they're provided to me. I am not going to be providing these images. So you can use any image file that you want. You can create something in Paintbrush, which we will talk about. Uh, and you can, again, you can use any image that you want keeping in mind that the size of it is going to be important. So this image to CPP is an online tool. Again, you can use it offline. It is nice because it does have an Arduino code output option. Uh, you can also output just the plain bytes. We'll talk about a little bit of that. And you also notice that there's a GFX bitmap font and Arduino code single bitmap. Now, the reason that we've got Arduino code and single bitmap option is because you can upload multiple images and then it'll put them all inside of individual arrays and it'll name them based on the file name. So that's pretty handy. The other option that we have, and again, these are only two, there are 
probably dozens of different options. People write code to do this all the time, and it can be included directly in some of your Arduino code. So it can pull images directly from, say, an SD card, if you're storing something in SD, and convert it on the fly. We're not going to be going through that, but I do have a link here. And again, use this at your own discretion. I believe this is the, uh, the LCD image converter that Adafruit suggested in one of their tutorials. The reason that this one is nice is because it gives you a lot more options. Now, the image to CPP gives you pretty much everything you need for probably 99% of the time. But the LCD image converter download gives you a few more options. So we will talk about both of those. I'll show you how both of them work. And then uh, we'll transition into creating a sketch, creating an Arduino sketch. So first things first, I need to choose the file. Now I'm gonna be using the speedometer and the way that these files were designed, uh, they were drawn with transparency in the background. Now you'll notice the preview on the screen shows transparency. We can see that the 240 by 240 pixel size, but we can see that it's round here. However, the preview doesn't show it as round. And this is one of the main problems that you're gonna have when converting these images. Now you might think to yourself, why can't I just put the image on onboard storage? Why can't I use an SD card? If you're using an M5 stack like I am, it has an SD card already on it. So why can't I just load it and bring it in? Well, you can do that, but the problem with that is the speed. And you don't really have the same way to take an image in that format and put it into a sprite. At least I haven't found a good way to do that. So converting it to a CPP or this byte array is going to be probably the most efficient way, but there are limitations just like with everything else. The, that first limitation is obviously with the transparency, which we can fix and I will talk about that, but the transparency in the background. The second problem is memory and memory management. Now, thankfully the M5 stack has a decent amount of memory. If you're trying to do this on something like an Uno and you've uh, attached a, an LCD display to it, you're probably going to run up against memory issues. Now there are things like loading it into program memory. Uh, sometimes you've got PS RAM, depending on the chipset, if you're using an ESP32, like uh, is available with the M5s, then you can go in and you can tweak the code and allow or open up that, um, that PS RAM. Again, I don't really wanna get into the nitty gritty of memory management, mainly because one, I'm not a programmer, so I kind of have to fumble my way through some of these things, but I wanna focus on the task at hand. And I just simply wanna mention that if you're using another display or another board, then you might need to use smaller image sizes. Now, again, there are other aspects of this that are important, but let's just take a look at the preview here so we can understand some of the options. So right now, the preview is showing everything with just black and white colors. The resolution doesn't look very good. And initially, the image that we had displayed, that image had red and white on it. So when we look at the Speedo, this is what we are expecting to see. There's not a lot of color here, but those dots are definitely red. So why can't we see the red dots on our preview? Well, part of the reason is because right now, by default, we're looking at what's called one BP or one bit per pixel. Now, one bit per pixel is great when you wanna use just black and white. If I generate the code, you can see that each of these is representing a single pixel inside of our, our byte array. So what the code is doing is it's looking at each of these and it's saying, okay, well, pixel one, one is this color, pixel one, two is this color, and so on, all the way through all 240 by 240 pixels. So you could obviously do this manually if you really did not like your time and you wanted to spend hours and hours trying to manually hard code a pixel array. It's much easier to draw something. Uh, even if you don't have the drawing skills, you can likely find something that's pretty close and adjust it. But doing this manually is just a nightmare. But it can be done. But the, the interesting thing here is that at one bit per pixel, all we're essentially doing is we're turning a pixel on or off. It's black or white. If we go to two bytes per pixel and you can see 565, that is the format that we want to see when we're talking about the code that is going to be in our Arduino sketch. And the reason for that is because 
when we look up the way that colors are defined inside of these these bytes, well, zero f f f f is going to be white. Zero 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 is going to be black, and then there are all, all these different variations of this. And essentially, what this means is the five six five is the red green blue five for the number of bytes representing red six for green and five for blue now if you want more information on that you can obviously search the internet and find tons of information on that i'm not going to get too deep into this but the important thing here is that we understand that the byte array that the program is looking for in order to display this image correctly is that 565 you'll see that when we go into the next program and and you'll be able to understand that is what we're looking for and if you ever have any questions, you can obviously take a look at what is displayed here. And when we take a look in some of the libraries in Arduino code, so for example, I'm going to go ahead and pull over the, um, in this case, it's the ILI 9341. Now, this is part of the M5 stack utility, but the way that M5 works is they pull in other libraries and they just include them in their base library. So we can see here that the definition for black is 0, X, 0, 0, 0, 0. That's red, green, and blue are all 0. Navy is uh, basically half percentage in the blue. We've got dark green is, is half in the green, and so on. And as we go through here, we can see that this is when we call things like black or navy or dark green in our program. It's because they're already defined inside of the libraries. We already know that if we type in black, it's going to give us this value. And the code already understands what that means. But back to the image to CPP. When we look at this, we are still not seeing the red here. It just looks like it's black and white. You can play around with the other options and you can see how that changes the image preview. And if you ever have any question, you can manually go through some of this code and make sure that it's not just all black and white but that you do actually find other values. And it doesn't take long. We can expand this a bit and we can scroll down. Let's go ahead and just bring this down a bit more. So as we scroll through here, again, what you're doing is you're looking for other values that are not just black and white. These might be shades of gray. Uh, if there's any sort of uh, you know shadowing effect that's on any of these, obviously right here in the center, this logo is not just pure black and white, but you wanna really look through the generated code to make sure that you see that. Another thing to note, when we change the background between black, white, or transparent, it appears to have transparency, but the code is, is not really giving us that. Now, in order for us to have transparency based on the predefined ESPI library, which again is included in M5 stack, we need to have 0x0120. Now, when we get into that, we're going to go ahead and go through an example of how to manually do that. If you ever are going to make an image where you want the background to be transparent and there is white involved in the image, then you want to make it a color that's not going to be used, something like pink or cyan or magenta, a color that is very easy to pull out. If you ever look for sprite sheets online for characters and, and animations or games, a lot of times you'll notice that the backgrounds are really interesting colors. They might be a pink or a, a certain green, and that's because you can find the byte value for that color and you can pull it out and switch it to a transparent color. Now, I would love it if this worked and it gave us the transparent value for the background, but unfortunately it doesn't. And we can't just swap out the black because unfortunately there's black other places on the gauge. If we swapped out the white as transparent, then everything would be transparent. Now that might be okay if you wanna change the color of the back face behind the gauge. Not exactly what we're doing here, but just note again that there are variations to this. I'm gonna go ahead and use the black background. I'm gonna generate the code. You'll notice it changed a bunch of these to 0x0000, which is representing black. And I'm gonna come back a little bit later and we're gonna copy this output into a, an Arduino code. But for right now, I'm just gonna leave it as is. Now I wanna talk about the same thing in this LCD image converter that's in the second link. Now, the way that this one works is first we need to open a file. I'm gonna use the same exact file. So I'm gonna use the Speedo and it brings it in. We can see transparency behind it. Now, one of the benefits to this LCD image converter is again, there are more options. There are some options for things like scaling, but it only allows us to resize it to scale it up and not to scale it down. 
We can convert it to grayscale if we want. We can um, export it to an external tool. We can do some things in here. So for example, we can um, pick some color options and you'll notice that if we hover over here and we click on something, you can see that we are actually drawing on the screen. I'm gonna undo that because I wanna leave it as is. But again, there are a couple more options in here. This one here is a, like a swap color. So for example, if we wanted to change red to another color, then we could pick that other color. In this case, we could change that color to something else. Again, I'm not gonna be modifying this image, but just note there are a handful of tools that can be pretty helpful. The next thing that we need to do to convert this is we go to options and select conversion. Now, once we get into the conversion here, there's a lot happening. So let's talk about each of these and let's talk, try to understand what's going on. So first, the type of image is gonna be color. We also can do grayscale and monochrome, so basically on or off, black or white. The color is gonna be our option because again, we do have red. There are a couple of other colors that, that sneak in here uh, for the shading. So we wanna make sure that we do use this as color. The scanning direction, you'll notice it's going top to bottom and forward. And that's gonna change what's happening over here. And this is essentially telling you how it's going through the image and it's pulling those pixels out. Now this is important for a few reasons. Depending on how you plan on displaying this, if you're using an LCD, then you're gonna to wanna to use top to bottom and the forward option. That's how it's gonna be looking for it inside of the byte array. If you're doing something like uh, an array of NeoPixels, if you've built your own sort of pixelated display, depending on how you may have wired that up, you might have to reverse every other line. Now, this tool doesn't allow for that. You have to do it manually. And what that means is if you have a 240 by 240 pixel image, every other line, you're going to have to swap out. So what you would do is convert this using the forward option and convert it again using the backward option. And then you'd have to manually go and flip those lines. Now, if you happen to have an image that is perfectly symmetric, then you don't have to worry about it, obviously, because left to right or right to left won't matter as long as it is truly symmetric. So just keep that in mind if you're using something else besides an LCD image. This does give you some options for ways to control the scan direction, but depending on how you wired things up, it might take a good bit of time. There are also some other tabbed options here, talking about the matrix of colors, reordering image font and templates. The two main things that we really wanna focus on is one, the preset, making sure that we are using that RGB565. And you can see that it's displayed here as R5G6B5, but it's the same 565 that we used in the image to CPP. So that's the one that we want, and that'll give us the correct output that Arduino is looking for. Note that if you go to the 888 option, then you're extending into 24 bit. You're going to a deeper range or a larger range of color values. And the 565 is what we are going to put in our code and that's what the code is expecting. So that's where we're, we're going. The prefix zero X is what we wanna see. And again, that's how these colors are defined inside of the libraries and that's what we want. We're gonna leave split rows. And what that means is in our code, it's going to give us individual rows and then it'll go down to the next line. We're not gonna worry about trailing bits, but the, the two other important aspects here are going to be the block size and then the byte order. So the block size for us, we're gonna be using 16 bit and that's gonna give us the code, which is 0x0000. It's gonna give us the appropriate number that will represent the colors in our code. If we happen to go to 24 bit or down to eight bit, the eight bit is gonna give us the format of zero X zero zero. The 24 bit will give us two extra digits inside of the, each byte in the array. So keep in mind that the block size that we're gonna be using for this image and for probably most images that you're gonna come across for doing something like this will be the the 16-bit block size and the color will be the 565. The last bit that I wanna mention here before we actually preview this and convert it is the byte order. Now, this little endian and big endian, these byte orders are going to change the way in which the colors are displayed on the screen. So if you happen to convert an image and the red is purple, then that typically means that the byte order is reversed. Now, the good thing is that we can actually affect that change directly in the code. 
So my suggestion is to leave this option, the, the, the default option, using little endian. And then what we're going to do is we'll talk about in the code what would happen if the colors were swapped. There's an option to set swap bytes using the, again, the ESPI library, which is included in M5 stack. And by turning that on, you can change which one of these you would use. And again, I suggest that you use the default. And if the colors happen to be backwards, then you can go ahead and, and swap it in the code. Now, I will say that a good way to sort of test this is to start by creating an image in just paintbrush or wherever you want. Make a bunch of different colors, you know, reds, greens, and blues. Change the hue, make them lighter or darker. And then bring that image in here, convert it to code, and display it on your screen. Make sure that the colors are correct. Make sure that the, the bytes aren't swapped and figure out what you need to do to make your code work. For this example, I've already played around with it. I know that this should work. If it doesn't, then we'll address that problem. But this should be fine with these settings, 565, 16-bit block size, the prefix of 0x, the delimiter is a comma. That's Again, that's what it's going to look for in the arrays. If you were using something besides Arduino and you needed a different delimiter, you could include that here. But once we have all of the things set, what we're going to do is show preview. Now, if we were to try to save or export this, it exports as an XML file. So all we're going to do is we're going to copy this. Now, again, it's important to note that the preview here appears to have transparency, but that's not the case because anytime we create a sprite or we display an image, it has to be rectangular in nature. In this case, it's square 240 by 240, but it's not going to be round. Now, I do know that the subscriber that sent this to me, Anthony, has a round display, a round LCD. So if there's extra information on the outside of it, uh, it's probably not a problem. Most of the time, LCDs or screens will have a buffer range where you can display outside of uh, the actual values. The top left corner will still be zero, zero, and you kind of have to work within those constraints. I'm using a square display, 320 by 240, so uh, it doesn't really matter to me if it's round or square, but we will talk about ways in which we can address that. So as we look through here, what you see, the code looks very similar to what we got from image to CPP. We've got 0xffff, remember that's white. So that top left corner, even though it looks transparent, is white. And then as we go down, we should see some, uh, some zeros for black. And you can see that here we've got some black, and then there's some other colors in here. And these other colors typically are going to represent again, some different grayscale values because there is some shading that happens. Uh, for the most part, all the colors are either black, white, or red in this gauge. But again, there is some shading that happens, especially around that logo. Now, if you happen to make this grid, let's say in a spreadsheet in Excel, and you wanted to manually build this out, you could visually see what this looks like. So if we expand this, and we had 240 rows uh, wide and 240 columns, then we could actually see this image take shape just by the fact that these are different, you know, these look different enough that when we scroll through the code, we would be able to see that. I don't really, again, I don't recommend it. If you're doing something smaller, like a 16 by 16 pixel spray or 32 by 32 even, then you can maybe do this manually, but there are so many tools out there that makes this easy to do that you really don't need to go through that process. All right, so that was quite a bit. Again, I'm not going to be using the LCD image converter, this download option. We are going to be focusing on the code that came directly out of the image to CPP website, which again, you can download, you can uh, run it offline. I'm going to go ahead and close the image to CPP. And again, we're using Arduino code, horizontal two bytes per pixel, 565. And the identifier prefix, the prefix here doesn't really matter. If we copy the entire code, what that does is it'll, it, you can see here that it takes the name of the file that we fed it, and then it adds the EPD bitmap in front of it. Now I'm gonna change the name of the, the, uh, the gauge that we're gonna call in our code because I don't really wanna type all that every time I wanna call this gauge. I'll simply call it speedo white or something like that. Keeping in mind that 
again, as I mentioned, this came from a subscriber. He sent me these images, so I am not going to share them because he did create them himself. I don't want to just freely share these out. But you can create something like this on your own. Again, in Paintbrush, you could do it. Uh, you could do it in any image software if you're using free software like GIMP or paint software like Photoshop. You could certainly create your own gauges. They could be square, they could be round, whatever you want. But just keep in mind that the size, the pixel size, the 240 by 240 in this case is going to be a very important number. So if you're making something that's a different size, then you just need to understand or know what that value is. Otherwise, it won't display properly. And we'll get into that when we get into the code. So the first thing I'm going to do before I copy this code is we're going to go into our Arduino sketch. This is a, a brand new sketch. And what we're going to be doing here is we're going to talk about the basics that we need to set up a program like this. Anytime I do a project like this and I'm trying to learn how to do something, it's it's very easy to just go in and find an example and then try to tweak it to, to make it work uh, like you want. Now, unfortunately, with something like this, there was a lot of back and forth and testing and, and playing around with it to figure out how it worked, at least to, to, you know, to me and to my, the way that my brain works. Uh, so hopefully the way that I explain things here will make sense. And if you are an actual programmer and there's something I say that's incorrect here, please leave a comment and, and correct me so that everybody has the right information. But we're gonna start, we're gonna talk about first how to put that code, that byte array into an Arduino sketch. We're gonna talk about how to display it and then we'll get into the sprites. So the first thing I need to do with my sketch is I need to include my m5stack.h. So again, if you are using another board and you're using another display, then you need to make sure you understand what exactly is needed for those different bits. Now, the M5 stack is great, and I, and I know I keep saying this, I have no affiliation with M5, but I've used enough Arduino boards and played around with enough of these little microelectronics projects that having it all in one package that has buttons, a speaker, microphone, SD card, a battery, in this case, the gray has an accelerometer, which I do plan on using later on for other projects. But in order to have all that in one package that already has a, an LCD display, and you don't have to wire anything up, is extremely powerful. It helps you get your project started quicker, playing around with them much quicker than having to fiddle around with what libraries to include and go through the process of trying to make everything just work before you ever get started. So we've got the pound include m5 stack.h. Now, I think at this point, it's important to understand that whenever we include a library, the m5 stack.h, for example, what we're doing is we're telling the sketch that I need this library because it contains all the little bits of code that I need to do things like display images on my LCD, to send text to my screen, to make the speaker beep, to access information from the SD card, or to even access external pins. With that in mind, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be creating our own .h tabs inside of our sketch. Now, the reason that we want to do this is because if we go back to the image to CPP, the code for the 240 by 240 array is very long, right? So we've got 240 by 240, each pixel in that array requires a single line inside of that array. So that means that we've got a lot of code. And we don't want to just put that at the very top of our, our program here because then everything that's important to us in this program is going to be buried in the bottom. So the way that we do that is we make our own .h tab inside of here. But the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to save this. So inside of here, we need to find a location that you want to save your project. And once you have that location, just name the sketch whatever you want. In this case, I'm going to call this one um, image based gauge. Again, you can call it whatever you want, but I just want to name it something that is meaningful. I remember exactly what it is. Now that we have our image based gauge, in order to create our own dot H, what we're going to be doing is at the very top right, we're going to select this down arrow and select new tab. At the very bottom, we need to give it a name. Now, 
when we give it a name, what we're going to be doing is adding that dot h to it. So in this case, what I'm going to say is speedo, and we can add whatever we want, but keep in mind that when we type this in, we're going to have to retype it to include the library. So just make sure that it's case sensitive and everything is what you want. Add the dot h and say OK. You can see now we've got this speedo.h tab. What we need to do inside the top of our main sketch is we say pound include. This time we're going to put it in quotes, and I'll, I'll explain why in just a second, but then include speedo.h and end quotes. So when we look at these dot h's, essentially when you put it in these brackets, what you're getting is an external library. This tells the code we're looking somewhere else for this. When we put it in quotes, the dot h is going to be internal to our, our current sketch. So it's included in the same folder structure. It's not in the library's folder structure inside of your Arduino IDE. So this gives us the ability to create other tabs, in this case, speedo.h, and then we can include whatever code we want in there, and then instantly we'll have it available. So there is another thing that we need to do when you're using the TFT ESPI library, um, or in this case, the M5 stack library, what I've found, at least from just some playing around, is that inside of each of these tabs, it wanted to also include the M5 stack library or ESPI or whatever you're using. And I think the reason is because it needs to be able to call some of those different functions. So just putting that, in this case, M5 stack.h at the very top, we'll make sure that our code runs smoothly. Now that we have that, I'm gonna go back to my website image to CPP. I'm gonna copy the code, so copy that output. And then back inside of my Arduino program, I am going to paste it. Now, when this happens, when specifically you're using image to CPP, there is some extra information in here that we actually don't need. So at the very bottom of this, you can see that it puts this um, EPDM bitmap all array length one, and then it gives you this call for the array. Now, the reason that you might want to do this is if you included multiple images in the image to CPP. Now, if that was the case, what would end up happening is it would hard code in the array values, and that might be a good way for you to call those different arrays. For us, we're going to be putting each gauge or each element onto its own tab or in its own .h file, so I don't need to do that. Another thing that we need to talk about is going to be things like the, the name, the units, or, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the variable declaration, and also this prog mem value. Now, this right here, again, it's going to be very dependent on the board that you're using and the memory that you have available. Essentially what that is doing is it's pushing this array into the program memory. Now this is where you start to get into a little bit of trouble with different boards like an Arduino Uno. This would definitely overrun the memory on an Uno. You probably don't have enough to do a 240 by 240 array and you'd have to go much smaller. With the M5 stack, I don't actually need to declare that it's going into program memory. Now, again, if you're using a lot of large full screen, 16-bit uh, color depth images, then you might actually need to enable the PS RAM or expand it and put it in, in there. But for this example, it actually works fine with um, multiple .hs. So I'm not going to worry about declaring program memory. Again, memory management is an important topic. It's something that you should look into. I, I don't really have a full grasp on all the memory management aspects, so I don't want to, to talk about that. So I'm going to leave it at that and just note that depending on the board that you're using, you might run out of room depending on the size of your image. So what I want to do is I want to rename this because I don't want to type in EPD underscore bitmap underscore mercury. I don't want to type all that in every time I need to call this. So what I'm going to just call this is speedo WHT, so speedo white. And this is the background, but I don't really need to worry about calling it the background. When we get to creating our sprites, we'll call or we'll create a sprite that is the background image, and then either the speedo or the tack or the temperature gauge, those can be called depending on what the user selects. That's 
kind of more of a long-term goal in this video we're only going to be talking about the speedo and the needle for the speedo but just keep in mind that the image that gets pushed into the sprite could be this image or it could be another image depending on what the user selects and that's why it gives us so much flexibility all right so back and the the main program the image based gauge i'm going to do a quick save and now what we've done is we've called m5stack.h which gives us access to do things like use sprites if we want to but more importantly in this first example we're going to be doing the m5.lcd to push it to the screen now if you're using another display another board again there are different ways that you need to do that you need to include different libraries you might need to use tft dot uh, draw circle you know those kinds of things are different depending on the libraries that you're using so m5 stack is going to give us access to all that include speedo.h is going to give us access to use speedo wht we do need to remember that it's 240 by 240 pixels a lot of times you might see examples where the pixel values are are actually coded in here as well and then you can access those global variables. We're not gonna be doing that. I'm gonna hard code those values in uh, simply because I know that you might be playing around with different image sizes and so on. Again, we're not gonna be doing anything with sprites, but I'm gonna go ahead and put a comment in here. Uh, we're gonna declare sprites for background and the needle. So that's gonna happen here before our setup. And then we're gonna go into setup and we need to do all of our standard stuff. Now, for me, with the M5 stack, we need to do m5.begin. So that will start the M5 stack. We're gonna do m5 stack power.begin. Again, allow it to use the battery so we don't have to be tethered to a USB cable. And then I'm gonna fill the screen. So m5.lcd.fill screen. Now the fill screen, I can use tft underscore white. I could also just type in white Again, these are declared various different ways depending on the libraries that you're accessing. The TFT underscore white is part of the ILI library for the display. Uh, the other just white is declared in another library. But again, M5 Stack automatically has access to all those. If you're using a specific T TFT library, then it's good for you to go into that code. When you download the library, there'll be a .c file that you can go into and you can just look at those declarations with a a notepad or a, a code, you know, a code IDE, not necessarily the Arduino one, but if you've got a Visual Studio or something on your computer, you can open those files up. Okay, so now in our setup, what we've done is we've essentially started the M5, we've power, we've said that we can use power and we filled the screen with white. Remember in this example, we're not talking about sprites yet. All we're doing is we're gonna be displaying it on the screen. So it's fairly simple for us to display the image. There is a command called push image. Now, again, you might be thinking to yourself, why didn't we just load it onto the SD card? I mentioned earlier on that that is a different place in memory inside of the, the device, in this, in this case, the M5 stack. And the amount of time it takes to bring the image off the SD card and display it on the screen it's just, it takes too much time for something that we're constantly gonna be updating with a speedo needle or something like that. And on top of that, it at least I haven't found a way with this library to take that image, a PNG, with transparency and push it into a sprite. Now, I haven't found a way to do it. That doesn't mean that that's not possible, but just for me, it was much easier to use this byte array. So we're gonna use the byte array and we're going to say m5.lcd.push image. Now, when we have a push image, there are a couple of things that it needs. Now, if you actually go into the library, and I'm going to go ahead and open this up. So if you go into the library, in my case, m5stack.h, which brings in uh, LCD, in this case, the LCD values. Again, they're coming from the different LCD libraries because they're just including those. But as we look through here, you'll notice that we don't see a push image in here. Now, sometimes when you have the LCD values, we've got drawing pixels, we've got draw image, draw circle, and so on. And we've got these things like draw bitmap and draw JPEG. And this is if we're pulling them out of the SD card. We've got information for the buttons, we've got information for the speaker, 
And then as we go down through here, we can see the different libraries that are included for the various things, the buttons, the display, and so on. If we go into the sprite.h library, this is where we have a lot of the sprite commands, things like creating the sprite, um, selecting the frame buffer for graphics. We're not really talking about that. It's not needed for what we're doing. And then the color depth and so on. Now inside of here, we have a command called push image. Now if we, we scroll down through here, we've got push sprite, we've got draw character, but you'll notice that it's not listed here either. Now, a lot of times, if you can't find what you're looking for inside of these libraries, yeah, you have to do a little bit of digging, whether that is going through example codes or whether that is finding a library that will actually do what you want. Now, in this case, push image is looking for an X and Y coordinate, a location to push the image, the width and the height of that image, and then the name. So this uint16 and you can see here it's got an asterisk data. This is looking for the name of the image that we're pushing because it's pushing it from that, that byte array, that CPP. And this command, even though it's in the sprite.h, is actually inheriting from somewhere else. So it actually comes from uh, another library. So we should be able to use push image with just the m5.lcd. Again, if you're using a different TFT library, if you have one specific for your display, you will need to do a little bit of digging and investigative work. A lot of times you can go into your examples. You can go, in this case, M5 stack, advanced, display, and you can find a TFT demo. A lot of these TFTs will be coming from the TFT library, which again, M5 stack really is just pulling in other libraries that have already been designed for the different components. So a lot of times going in here, you can find examples that will work. Uh, so for example, a custom fault, fonts, flash bitmap, things like this. So if we open up flash bitmap, this has the .h, and you can see here they've got uh, different, different icons, so they're declaring those widths and height values. And then if, let's go ahead and expand this. And then if we go into the actual code and we go through here, you can see that they're using push image. They're pulling in the width and the height values, and then they're calling info. So if we go here, info is the name that they gave to this byte array. So a lot of times finding these examples will help you figure out exactly what you need. For us, again, we're gonna be pushing a 240 by 240. That means that my screen is 320 by 240, which means that this actually needs to be moved over. It's not gonna be going in from zero, zero. So 240, is going to it's going to take up 240 pixels wide inside of our screen which means that it's leaving 80 pixels left and then we need to put that in half so we're going to be going over 40 in the x direction or the horizontal direction and then it's going to take up the full height of this display that i'm using so zero here and here's the important bit if you ever are trying to push a byte array you need to know exactly the width and the height. So in our case, the display, the image is 240 by 240. If I even change this to 239 by 239, the image will come up all jumbled because as it's going through, it starts to write the image. And then when it gets to the end and it still has more in the array, it starts to rewrite over. So you'll notice the colors, you might get some funky lines. And even inside of the image to CPP, at the very bottom, when you're using uh, the one bit per pixel, they give you a little like an option here that says, if it looks messed up, try a different mode. Uh, and that's, again, that's because it just continues to rewrite and tries to, tries to push that information. So once again, let's go back to our Arduino code. And now we need to call the specific image. And again, this is called speedo white. We can copy that or we can just type it. And then we're going to close this off. Now, I do want to make one more note here, and we're going to go back to the library for this. Now, this is looking for a uint16 underscore t for the name. Now, that's important to note that this is exactly what we have this defined as. If we happen to call this an unsigned short, for example, then 
we would have to do a little bit of extra work in this push image. And the way that we would do this is we would include the, uh, in this case, we would include the pointer that we want, which is uint 16 underscore t. And then we would include an asterisk and the brackets, close those brackets off. And essentially what this is doing is it's converting the speedo wht if it was a, an unsigned short, for example, it would convert it to that uint 16 underscore t, that 16-bit pointer. Now, we don't need to do that because ours is defined in the correct, it has the correct variable type that it's looking for, so we don't have to worry about that. But if you happen to come across an example and you see that in the code, it's simply because it's converting, on the fly, it's converting that information to make sure that whatever library it's pulling from, in this case, if it's pulling from the TFT library or the ESPI, that it has the correct value. So theoretically, everything that we've done here, this should display the image on the screen. So let's go ahead and do another quick save to make sure that everything is saved. And I'm gonna upload this. So I'm gonna upload this to my board. I can see in the bottom right-hand corner that I have my M5 stack the ESP32 chip board connected. So we should be able to push that directly to the board. And it should, you know, it should start, it should put white background, and then it should push this image. This happens once in setup, we didn't do anything in the loop, so nothing else is happening or needed. So fingers crossed this will work, let's take a look. So you'll notice that it does display but we do have an issue with the colors. You can see there's some purples and some reds that are happening. And really what we should see is mostly a black and white gauge and red dots in the corner. Now, this is where the LCD program comes in handy because again, we can determine the way in which the byte order is created. We do have that set swap bytes option, but again, we need to think about this in terms of the number of images that we're converting, how we're converting them, and what is the best option. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at the image to CPP. And notice that we have horizontal, but we don't really have uh, any other way to sort of manipulate what's going on in terms of the direction. We have this invert image colors, which will invert them here, and there's a chance that that will work. But if we use the downloadable LCD image converter and we go ahead and let's just open up the Speedo white. We're gonna go into the conversion. We're gonna to go to image. We're gonna use this little Endian option. Make sure that it's on 565. We're gonna show the preview. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy all of this and I'm gonna paste this into my Arduino code. So inside of my image base, I'm gonna to go to speedo.h. I'm gonna take everything out here. And this does take quite a, quite a while to scroll through. So what we can do is I'm just gonna do some page downs, holding down shift. Uh, we could also go all the way to the end, but if you have some additional code after this, then you don't wanna just select the whole page. So I'm gonna delete that and I'm gonna paste the new stuff in there. And we wanna make sure that when we paste this that we do still have the bracket and the semicolon at the end. If we don't have that, it will throw an error. And this should just instantly replace everything that we had. So we can save this and we can try to upload it again and see if this works. Now, again, I did mention that there is a option for setting the swap bytes and that will fix the color. But I think it's important that we understand the way in which each of these programs work. So if the image to CPP gives you the right color right away, that's perfect. If it doesn't, you can use this set swap bytes. If it does, um, or if it doesn't work and you go to the, uh, the LCD image converter, then at least you have the little and big Endian options. So let's take a look and see what this pushed for us. So you can see that it's, essentially the same. Uh, you can see that the entire background is white instead of having the black border, and that was just based on the image to CPP settings. So this means that we can do one of two things. Again, what we can do is the set swap byte. So m5.lcd.set swap bytes. And we need to set that to true. 
Now, if we set that to true, that should upload and fix the color for us. So let's go ahead and save it and upload it. I'm gonna use Control U to upload and take a look one more time. Okay, so now we can see that the colors are fixed. So if you have this issue, whether your image is coming from uh, Photoshop or GIMP or Paintbrush or wherever, if it's a PNG, if it's a bitmap, if you push the image and the colors are swapped like that, then you can use set swap bytes. Keeping in mind that inside of the LCD image option that we could change this to the big NDN option, and that would also fix the byte order. So this option right here is the same thing as the set swap bytes. So what's happening is basically we need to figure out what options work best for our images to make sure that the colors display properly. And this is why I said sometimes it's helpful to go in and in the beginning and create just a basic image. It's got red, green, and blue on it and display it to make sure that those colors are coming through proper. Again, the red will likely be flipped to like a purple or a pink if the bytes are backwards. So for our example, I'm gonna carry on using the set swap bytes option, but note if you are using the image to LCD converter, you can switch it to use this big Endian option and that will, that will automatically make the bytes correct and you don't need to use set swap bytes. Using the image to CPP, I don't know exactly which options would fix that. So you could use the set swap bytes inside of the code here and get the same result. The next thing that I wanna do is I wanna make sure that we can also display the needle for the gauge. Now, when we did this before in our previous example, the gauge itself and the needle were all drawn as sprites, but here we're gonna be bringing them in as images converted to those byte arrays. So I do have an image for the needle. Again, uh, Anthony was good enough to create this and send it over. And what I'm gonna do is I've just opened it up in Paintbrush. Again, you can open it up in whatever you want. It is helpful to view the grid lines and rulers and that information so we know exactly where the pixels are. And this is essentially what we're displaying on the screen. Now, the one thing that I don't like about this needle is that it's not exactly symmetric. You'll notice that there is a little pink pixel there that's a little bit higher. This is 11 pixels wide. And the reason that this is potentially problematic is because that means that we don't have a true center point for rotation. Now, ideally, if you have something like this that's going to be rotating about a pivot point, you would wanna make it an even number, so 10 or 12 pixels. So what we can do is we can adjust this a little bit, we can convert it, and then we can use it in our, our program. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna resize this a little bit. I'm gonna make it a little bit larger. And I just wanna make sure that it's even. So let's see, 14 by 106. I'm gonna use my selection box and I am going to cut that and then I'm going to repaste it. And the reason I'm doing that is it helps me move it over so that I have a true center point. Uh, again, the needle isn't exactly centered. So we could spend some time to redraw it here so that it was centered. I'm not gonna go to that depth but it is important that when you are creating something like this, that you do think about those aspects. The next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create sort of the center dial. Now you'll notice that the center dial here, I'm gonna go ahead and make it so that it's got one white spot in the middle. So I might be able to resize it a little bit and uh, just play around with it until you get it right. It looks like that this isn't gonna be quite tall enough, so I'm gonna make it a little bit taller. That way I can put the full, sort of the full circle in there. And what I'm really aiming for here is to make sure that I have a true center point. And that true center point, if I hover the cursor over, is six by 103. Now that's important because that's gonna be our pivot point. The pivot point where the needle rotates about the gauge. So six by 103. Now, from here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna save this image. Now, you can also think about doing a save as. And when we do a save as, we should really think about the color display. So 256 color is gonna be eight bit, 16 color bitmap, and then we've got 24. Now, remember we're using 16 color, so that's what I'm gonna save it as. And I'm just gonna call this, um, it's, it's again, it's gonna be 14, by 110, that's the size. So I'm just gonna put it directly in there and save it. 
Yes, I know that the transparency is gonna be lost. The transparency isn't going to matter anyways. But notice that when I do this, the reds turn to grays here. So this instantly has an effect on the quality of the image. So these are things that we need to be mindful of when we're doing things like image conversions. If we go from something that has a lot of color depth, maybe 24 color depth, and we convert it, that doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna get the same result. So you do need to spend some time and really think about these aspects. Do you really want to make sure that um, all of these all of these different uh, pixels are gonna have shading and different colors in? And if you do, when you're drawing them, if you're using Photoshop or something, be mindful of the color depth and the colors you're picking. Don't just go in and just grab any old color because it might not fit into the byte array. So I did save this twice. I did save it, just did a save as a PNG before I did this conversion. So if I go to the recent ones, you can see that it's still here um, because I did save it first without converting it. And you can see that we have sort of that red, pink shadowing effect on the side of the needle. So once again, six by 103 is our pivot point and I need to go back and I need to convert this as well. So I'm gonna go open. This is going to be uh, the needle. And again, I did not, uh, this one here, the 14 by 110 is saved in a reduced quality. So I wanna make sure that I bring it in with the highest quality possible. I'm gonna convert it. For uh, this image, we should also think about the byte order. And the big thing that you would wanna really consider here is if you're converting a lot of gauges. So for example, if we're gonna include the tack and the coolant temp and the coolant pressure and the fuel gauge, we would wanna make sure that all of those were done with the same setting. Otherwise, what's gonna end up happening is if you use the byte swap and then you end up swapping the gauge that's being displayed, the colors are gonna be wrong. So it's gonna be very important that you do at least keep a consistency about what the byte order is going to be. Now for this one, I'm gonna continue using that, that option. I'm gonna copy all of this. Now keeping in mind that this program doesn't offer the same default code that we got when we did this one here, but that's okay. We, we can make it up as we go along as well. So I'm gonna create a new tab. This one is gonna be called needle.h. So once again, I'm, I'm creating another one here. And when I do a, a paste the code in, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be pasting it into something very similar to this. So I'm gonna copy that. I'm gonna come down and paste it. I'm gonna put a comment at the top. Needle is 14 by 110 pixels with pivot at six by, I don't even remember, I already forgot. So if we come back here, it's six by 103. So six by 103. So again, just kind of keeping that note in here. Obviously the Speedo is not the right name. So this one is just gonna be Needle. Now we could, if we were going to have different color options, we could do needle red uh, if, if we wanted to include that or if we had some sort of distinguishing value. I do also need to finish off the, um, the brackets here and I need to put that semicolon after. Again, that will cause an error if we don't include that. So let's go ahead and go back to here. We'll show the preview and we will copy this code. All right, so now this should display our needle. And because this is only what, 14 pixels wide, you can actually get some sort of visual cue that we've got our pivot point down here because it's all zeros and those are all black color. Everything with the FFF is white. And what this means is that we now know that we've got the needle, but we need to do a pound include and we're gonna include needle.h. And now we should be able to call needle red and display this on the screen. Again, we do need to be mindful of the size, 14 by 110. So what we can do is we can go m5.lcd.push image. We need to figure out where we're going to put it. And what we want to do is we wanna put it where it should be, right? We do have to remember that the needle is drawn uh, essentially pointing straight up. So our pivot point 
it, we want it to be in the center of the screen. But that pivot point is, is not exactly what we're pushing to the screen right now. We're pushing that top left corner. So we're gonna put it at, uh, you know, roughly centered because we know that the center of our gauge is going to be 160, but we have to subtract the width. So 160 minus uh, seven. So we're gonna do 153 in the X direction. And then we need to figure out how far down it needs to go. We know the overall height is 240. We know that our needle is going to be 114. So it's almost there. We just need to add like 20 pixels. Then we need to tell it what the size of that is. Now, remember again, we need to be very specific about that 14 by 110. Otherwise, it doesn't know exactly how, how far to go in the array when it's displaying these values. And then we're gonna do needle red and make sure that it is a const uint 16 underscore t, needle red, and that should display it on the screen. Now, when we do this, we do need to think about those swap bytes because when we're doing something like a sprite, we can swap bytes on the sprite specifically. But if the needle happens to come out wrong, then we might need to go back and redo the code. So let's go ahead and let's push this to the display and just see what it looks like. Well, so we can see that it does uh, does display properly. It is red, so we don't need to uh, swap the bytes. Everything is good there, but we do need to make sure that we do include the set swap bytes when we start to create our code with the sprites. However, you will notice that the white background is sort of getting rid of some of the gauge. It's pointing right at the 40, which is good, but it is getting rid of the icon behind it and it is getting rid of some of the gauge. And the reason that's happening is because all of this white space is not transparent. Now, remember I said very early on that the transparent value is 0x0120, at least for the libraries that I'm working with here. So what we can do is we can manually take those values and do a find and replace. So let's go ahead and go into our code. Inside of edit, notice that we do have a find option in here. So what we wanna do is we wanna to go to needle and what we're gonna look for is all of the white values, which is zero FFFF. And we're gonna replace them with zero, zero, one, two, zero. So let's go to edit and let's do find. We're gonna find 0x f f f f and we're going to replace it with 0x0120. So if we do a replace all, it should stick just to this needle.h, but we do need to double check that. So what we should see is all of these down here, the 0 by 120, those are all transparent now. But if we go to the speedo.h, we want to make sure we do still have white values there. Otherwise, the underlying display is gonna be messed up. So I'm gonna save this. I'm gonna push it to the display one more time. And what we should see now is that we've got the transparency that we want based on the needle. So one thing that we're noticing here is that the transparency behind the needle isn't working. Now, part of the reason it's not working is that the zero one to one value for transparency is in the ESPI library or the, the sprite.h if you're using an M5 stack. So the reason that it's not working is because we haven't actually created sprites and the sprites with transparent background will actually are actually able to pull up the pixels from the image underneath it and then simply use those in place of the transparent pixels. So when we're using push image, it's not really giving us the full picture. So the main thing that I wanna make sure we understand here is that we, we need to get the colors correct. And we wanna make sure that the colors for both the speedo and the needle are correct with or without set swap bytes. But the, the really important bit is that the needle needs to work without swapping the bytes. The gauge doesn't really matter because the gauge is gonna be the background, but the needle will have to have that transparency over top. And if the colors aren't right and we need to swap the bytes, then the transparency will turn to black instead of being actual transparent. So now that we have that bit of information, and we know that both the speedo and the needle are coming in their correct color without swapping the bytes, I can get rid of that line. And actually we don't even need 
the push image for the LCD for the speedo or the needle because now we're going to get into actually creating them as sprites. So make sure that you do save uh, everything that you've done so far. I'm going to comment these two lines out and then we'll get on creating them as sprites before we delete that. All right, so now that we have those commented out, the setup is pretty much done. Now, I did mention that the, the transparency on the needle is not going to work until we actually create a sprite with it because the sprite has the ability to pull the pixels from underneath. So we're just going to have to wait to make sure that the transparency works. And then later on, we can come back and we can just verify that the 0 by 0, 1, 2, 0 is actually transparent. So in order to create the sprites, remember we need to declare them at the top. Now, the M5 stack uses the ESPI library, which ends up creating these E sprite declarers. So what we're going to do is we're going to do TFT underscore lowercase e capital S, and we're going to call this first one gauge background. So gauge back just so that it simplifies what we have to type. And that's going to be equal to TFT underscore E sprite. And we're going to do an ampersand m5.lcd. Now, remember, again, if you're using another development board, another display, typically what you would include here is the TFT. Uh, and that's simply because the M5 LCD is how we're displaying stuff on the screen. So in your code to display something on your LCD, if you're doing TFT.push image or TFT.fill circle, then that's what you would include in here. Now this is our gauge background. We also need one for the needle. So we're gonna repeat the process. And I typically type these things because I love to introduce extra error into the program. So um, feel free to copy and paste, but I'm gonna call this needle. This is equal to TFT E sprite. And that is going to be again, ampersand m5.lcd. So this is basically telling it what the call is that we use to display something on the screen. So for us, that's M5 LCD. If Again, if you're using something different, then that's gonna be your TFT or, or whatever your call is to actually create or push items to the screen. Now, if you remember back to the, the first, or the last sprite video that we did where we declared a bunch of these different functions. We had our void setup and our void loop but then after that, we created things like plotting the gauge, and we, um, we created all these for very specific reasons, because in order to composite the sprites together, we need to first create them, and we need to populate them with something. So the way that this is going to work is we're going to populate the gauge sprite, the gauge back sprite, with the gauge image, and then the needle can just be displayed over and over again at different angles on it. But getting those created first is going to be the important step because we don't want to recreate them every time. Otherwise, we're going to get that flashing on the screen. We just need to know that they are going to be two separate images drawn in RAM and one's going to be displayed over the other. And that's why the transparency is going to work. So the way that we're going to have this happen is we're going to create three additional functions. We're going to create called one called plot gauge, and this is going to, well, really long term, we need to think about what this is going to mean in terms of variables that we're going to pass. Now, for, for our example, we're going to be sort of faking it with four loops on the screen so that we can get the needle to move. You could do the same thing with um, some sort of potentiometer if you wanted to just manually turn it and have it adjust the dial. Not going to go through that because that just includes extra components that you may or may not have. This way we can just use a for loop and ensure that if we pass it an angle that it can sweep through what we want. But if you are creating a gauge like this, which uh, in future videos we'll talk about where you're switching between a speedo and attack or a coolant temperature gauge or something like that, then you're going to be reading different sensors. And what that means is that this plot gauge is likely going to accept temperature, pressure, fuel level, speed, RPM. All of these different variables are going to have to go into this plot gauge. Uh, they're also going to have to go into other areas like the needle. You're going to have to know 
what you're passing in order to get that needle at the correct angle. And that's gonna differ whether you're talking about a fuel gauge or you're talking about the tachometer. There's all sorts of different mapping that has to happen with all these different variables. So in reality, you're probably gonna be passing a lot of variables if you're creating something like this, but we're just gonna simplify it here and just pass it an angle. And I'm gonna pass it um, int uh, 16 underscore T angle. Now, 16 is probably way more than we need, but again, sort of future proofing this because we are going to be thinking about all the other variables and values that we'd be passing. If you're reading, a, let's say a temperature sensor, it's the temperature sensor or pressure sensor is gonna be between a set of values. So those values might be a voltage. You might be reading between zero and one volt if you're pulling on something like an oxygen sensor or, and the, the middle value might be 0.45 or 0.5 volts. So what you're gonna end up doing is you're gonna end up taking all those variables and either mapping them inside of your loop or you're gonna map them inside of plot gauge so that it does plot an accurate value. So what we're gonna do again is, is we're just passing angle, but we're sort of future proofing it so we, we understand what's going on. Now inside of here, we're not gonna add anything just yet. I'm gonna create the other functions that I need because I know that I need them. We're gonna do void uh, create background. Now when we do the create background, I'm not gonna pass anything to it. I'm just gonna create the background image. And this is where user input for something like a button would determine which gauge gets displayed. Now, again, I, I plan to cover that in future videos. There's a lot to unpack with these topics, so I want to take them step by step so we understand them. And last, what we're going to do is we're going to create the needle. And again, the needle doesn't really need to accept anything because the needle is getting created, the, the needle sprite is getting created. And then what's happening is that sprite is just getting displayed at a certain angle on top of another sprite. So the only thing that really needs to accept any variables or values for us is going to be that plot gauge. And the plot gauge is gonna call create background and it's gonna take care of pushing the needle and then displaying the sprite. So now that we have all of, of those sort of placeholders, let's think about the code that's happening inside of there. We're gonna take care of our for loop in a little bit that's going to actually be calling or passing the angles but for right now all i really want to do is i i want to create something that can plot the gauge at a certain angle and i can pass it different values so in my setup what i want to do is i want to call before anything happens i want to plot the gauge, and I'm going to plot it at zero degrees. I don't know where that's going to be on the gauge. It's probably going to be pointing straight up, and we're going to have to map it from, you know, one angle to the next. Then I want to create the needle. Now, again, creating the needle isn't actually going to display anything. It's going to create the sprite for the needle. So it really depends on what's inside of plot gauge that, that is gonna determine this, but I need to make sure that that needle sprite is getting created. So I, I'm just gonna add a small delay in here just to slow things down if we wanna see what happens on the screen. Then what I need to do is I need to figure out what happens inside of each of these other functions. So when I call to plot gauge, what I want to happen is I want to call to create background. So the first thing that's going to happen is it's going to go to create the background, which is what's going to display the image on the screen. And then after that image is displayed on the screen, it'll come back to the plot gauge function. And after the plot gauge function, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the needle sprite, which remember up here, we named it needle, and I'm going to push rotated. Now, this is something that we covered in the last video where we talked about pushing the rotated needle. The only difference here is that in that example, we drew the needle in the create needle function. This time, all we're doing is we're gonna display the, the CPP or the byte array of the image of the needle. And that's really the main difference here is just how the image is getting created. So we're pushing that rotated value or we're pushing the rotated needle. And the, the amount that it's gonna get pushed is going to be, 
the angle that we passed it. But remember from the last example, what we have to do is do the ampersand and we have to include whatever the gauge background is. So that's gauge back for us. And what this is going to do is it's gonna push the needle into the gauge background sprite. It's gonna push it at the angle that we pass it into this function. And then the color, which is optional, is gonna be TFT transparent. And what this allows us to do is anything that's transparent will automatically pull the pixels from the image underneath, in this case, the other sprite, and display those in place of that transparent pixel. And after we've pushed the rotated needle to our gauge, what we need to do is we need to push the gauge sprite to the screen. So in this case, what we have is um, gauge back, which is our gauge background. We're going to do a push sprite, and we need to figure out where that's gonna be. Now remember, in this case, the, the last example we did where we drew everything, we just pushed it to zero, zero. In this case, we're dealing with around 240 by 240. So we're gonna push it that 40 pixels in, just like we did in the M5 LCD push image, and zero pixels down. In this case, with the push sprite, we don't need to specify the height and width because all that happens when the sprite is created, which we haven't done yet because that happens in another function. And then once again, we're gonna say TFT underscore transparent. So this is everything that needs to happen inside of plot gauge. However, none of the other stuff has actually happened. Nothing in create background has been populated yet. So now we need to go through the process of defining the sprite. So the first thing we're gonna do in, in create background is we're gonna say gauge back, which is the name for our, our background sprite, dot set color depth. Now the color depth in our case is going to be eight. Um, it's going to depend a little bit on your the colors that you're using, the display you have, and so on. For this example, eight uh, seems to work. If the color depth in your image for your display and your, and your board doesn't work, you might need to actually use 16. There will be a limitation again with, uh, with memory and other aspects of your development board. For the M5 stack gray that I'm using, this, the color depth of eight for these images seems to be fine. So I'm gonna do that and then I'm gonna do gauge back dot create sprite. Now this is important and again, what we're doing is we're creating the sprite to a certain value. What I could do is I could create the sprite to 320 by 240, the entire background size, and then I could uh, simply just put it at zero, zero. Now, the reason I don't wanna do that is because this allows me to move the sprite around if I want to, or I can display other sprites on the left and right. So I, I know Anthony who sent me these images is using a round LCD, but if he happened to be using a rectangular LCD, he could have the fuel display on the right-hand side, and he could have maybe a bar tachometer displayed on the left-hand side while speed is in the middle. And then you could cycle through different sprites and different gauges, so that way the speed could maybe be displayed on the left side, the, the fuel in the center, and the tack on the right, or, or so on. You know, there's all these different options. But basically the main thing we need to understand is that we just are creating the sprite, and it's 240 by 240 pixels. The next thing I need to do is I need to set the pivot point on that sprite. Now for me, again, gauge back dot, and it's gonna be set pivot, and it's gonna be right in the middle, 120 by 120. Keeping in mind that this value is setting the pivot point relative to the sprite. So in our case, 240 by 240, it's, it's really round. 120 by 120 is the exact center, which is exactly where the needle needs to pivot. Now, the, the second part of this is we need to tell the actual M5 display where its pivot point is. I'm gonna align those two. So I need to make sure that they're the same. And for that, I'm gonna do m5.lcd.setPivot. Again, it's the same call. The set pivot is the same call, but now we're working with 320 by 240. So center is gonna be 160 by 120. Okay, so all the stuff that we've done to this point is basically what we've done is we've told it the color depth, we've created the sprite, and we've set the pivot point for both the sprite and the gauge. We haven't actually created anything yet. So the next step for me is to start creating whatever the image is in here. So 
gauge back dot fill sprite. And I'm gonna fill it again with TFT transparent. This part doesn't really matter for the gauge background. I believe we could fill it with white or black or whatever, but I'm gonna fill it with transparent just in case it happens to be overlaid on something else. Now, again, it doesn't matter because our 240 by 240 is, uh, doesn't have transparency because we didn't set any of those pixels to it. However, if the transparency background was instead a magenta or uh, you know, maroon or, or some other color that we're not using, we could very easily flip that byte value to 0x0120. But again, it's just sort of a future-proofing placeholder. Now that we have the sprite created, we know the size, we know the pivot point, we've filled it with this transparent value, which is all 0x0120. or 0x0120. Now is the point where we can do gauge back dot push image. Now we need to push the image um, specifically to the right spot. Now we're pushing the image into the sprite. So that means that we're going to push it at 0, 0. And the size of it is 240 by 240. Now here is where if you defined the size, you could pull in those, uh, those variables, those global variables. We're just hard coding it in. And then we need to define the name of the thing that we're drawing in here. Now for us, that is speedo WHT. Now again, remember if your, uh, your image display happened to be defined as say a, a short, an unsigned short, then you would want to use that the uint 16 underscore t asterisk to convert it on the fly here. We didn't do that, so we don't need to worry about it. Okay, so now we've uh, successfully created the background. So calling create background, built the sprite, it pushed the image into the sprite, but we haven't displayed anything on the screen yet. The next step in that process, if we go through our plot gauge function, it's going to push the rotated needle directly to the gauge. Now, you might be thinking the needle, we, we didn't create the needle in the background, but that's exactly why in our setup, we created the needle. It never got pushed to the screen, but we, we still wanted to create the needle so that it actually existed. So inside of create needle, we're gonna follow the same thing. This is going to be needle.setColorDepth. And again, I'm gonna use eight for consistency, needle dot create sprite. And here is where we need to make sure that we're using the correct values. Now, if you don't remember, you can always go back to your comments, 14 by 110. So 14 comma 110 is the size of our sprite. Then we're going to push the image. So needle dot push image, and it's going to be pushed in zero, zero, and it's going to have to match our value. So 14, 110. And then we need to tell it what the, the name of the needle is. Now remember that's needle red. So capital N, capital R. And again, we shouldn't need to convert it uh, because it is the correct, uh, it has the correct definition for the variable type. So it should just work now. If we find that it doesn't, we'll come back and we'll push the conversion. And then we need to set the needle pivot. So needle dot set pivot. And again, that was six by 103, exactly why I make the note, because I will forget it. Six comma 103. And we've created the needle, we've pushed the image into it, and we've told it exactly where its pivot point is. So this pivot point is going to align to the pivot point that is created on our gauge background. And it's also going to align to the pivot point that is associated with the M5.LCD. Now, I've, I've had some issues with the set pivot before, and I found the most consistent way for me was to set the pivot in both sprites as well as on the M5 LCD. Now, it might be possible that you don't need to set it on the create background sprite at all, but what I ended up finding was if you don't, when you push the rotated needle and you set it into the gauge background, it will still rotate, but it'll rotate based on some arbitrary number or some other number that uh, is not going to be correct. So I, I find it just more consistent to set it on both sprites as well as on the M5 LCD display itself. All right, 
So at this point, let's go through and let's see what we've done. So in the setup, we're plotting the gauge, which plot gauge will create the background, which is right here. It will push the rotated needle based on whatever angle value we pass it, which is zero. And then it will push the sprite, the gauge background with the composited needle directly to the screen. Now, if all this works, let's go ahead and do a quick save. But if all this works, we should see that the transparency of the needle should now no longer be black. We should see the red needle and we should see that underneath it, anything outside of that red, the pixels have been pulled from that lower image. We haven't done any for loops. We haven't actually done anything in the loop at all. So this should just display on the screen and nothing else will happen. So let's go ahead and take a look. So as we look at this, a couple of problems have, uh, have shown up. So first, even though we tested out the lcd.push image and we corrected the code to make sure that the, the byte array actually had the right colors, the colors are not correct on the gauge. So this is telling me that we need to swap the bytes, at least for the background. We haven't seen the needle yet, so that could potentially be a problem. So what I'm gonna do is inside of my setup, I am going to swap the bytes, but only on the gauge background. So gauge back dot set swap bytes, and I need to make sure that that is true. So this isn't gonna fix the needle issue because we're not seeing the needle. But what this is going to do is it's going to allow us to see if at least that fixes the color on the background of the gauge. So let's go ahead and push that and let's take a look. All right, so swapping the bytes, at least on the gauge background, worked perfectly. But we still don't have a needle. And the main reason we don't have a needle just comes down to order of operations. So we plotted the gauge, which comes down to plot gauge passing at an angle. It creates the background, and then it pushes the rotated needle, and then it pushes the sprite. However, all of that happened before we ever created the needle. So we need to make sure that we do create the needle first. So I'm gonna move it up before plot gauge, and then we've got our display. I'm gonna save it and push it. Now, again, it's important we think about what's happening in what order. And the reason that this is important is because in the actual program, we're gonna be pulling information from different sensors and we need to store that information and we need to make sure that we push it at the correct time. So now that we know that the needle is being created before the gauge is plotted, we should see a gauge plotted with a needle on it. Let's take a look. All right, so we've got some good and some bad. So the transparency looks perfect. Everything seems to be working with seeing everything underneath it without obscuring it with a white block. However, it's purple. And that means that we can't use set swap bytes because it'll change those transparent pixels to black. And that means that we need to simply go back and we need to revert the code of the needle to previous code. And again, using the image converter, what we need to do is we need to change it to the correct option. And this is all, it's all gonna come down specifically to whichever option you used and partially I think how the image was created. So I'm gonna go ahead and just swap this code out. Let's go ahead and copy that. And then in my program under the needle, remember that we are gonna have to do that find and replace to get the transparency. So go ahead and just get rid of those and we're gonna paste in the new stuff. And now we wanna do a find and replace. So again, edit, find, it's already in here. We'll do a replace all. We'll save this and let's go ahead and push it one more time. All right, so that, that looks a whole lot better. That's exactly what we're expecting to see. We've got the needle, it's red, it has a transparent background, so it's not wiping out anything underneath it. So now we know that all the code, at least to this point, is good. And that just means we need to build out our loop, which is either pulling in data to adjust the angle of the needle, or we're using a for loop just to simulate sweeping the gauge. So for our example, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create that for loop so that we can 
go from zero all the way to 270 degrees and then back down to zero just to make sure that the transparency and all that aspect works. All right, so let's clean things up a little bit in the setup. Let's get rid of those uh, the, the images that we pushed directly to the screen. We've got this delay in the beginning. This is really just there to make sure that the gauge um, plots properly. We have to create the needle. Uh, it does need to, to happen in setup, but we don't have to plot the gauge if we don't want to. So we could take this object out or comment it out at least. The delay isn't really needed. That's again, that's just something that we can do to sort of slow things down. But we do need to swap the bytes on the gauge background. We've already seen that it was a potential issue and we do need to create the needle. But now what we can do is in our, our loop, we can start to create a void statement. And inside of here, what we wanna do is we want to go from essentially zero on the gauge all the way up to uh, 80 kilometers an hour, the way that it's, it's set up. And the way that we do that is we're gonna pass it an angle. We already know that plot gauge is looking to receive an angle. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a for loop and we're gonna plot the gauge with the I value or the angle value of the for loop. So to get started, we're gonna do for int I equals zero. We're gonna start at zero. I is gonna be less than 271 degrees. Because of the way that the gauge sweeps, it goes from negative 135 about there all the way up to positive 135 because zero, as we've already seen, when we plotted the gauge with zero from the setup, the needle was pointing straight up and down. So we're gonna go from zero to 270 basically, and we're gonna go five degrees at a time. So I'm gonna say plus equals five, and then we're gonna build out this for loop. So we're gonna do the same thing going from uh, basically all the way up, and then we're gonna sweep all the way down by just copying this and flipping the numbers. Now, when you're talking about doing this just as a demo or a practice versus actually reading in the inputs from sensors, uh, it's a little bit different because we're feeding it sort of idealized numbers. We saw the difference when we were talking about reading the GPS speed. And essentially what we're doing here is we're just reading in a value and we would pass it to whatever gauge we're gonna be plotting. Now, it's not true for our for loop. We wanna see the needle go around, make sure that we did everything right. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new value that is going to be a mapped value. So I'm gonna say int, and I'm gonna say angle map, and this is gonna equal this map function that we've already seen before. The value it's gonna take in is the current I value. We're gonna map that between zero and 270. Those are the angles that we're working with. And then we need to map it to the actual coordinates that we're gonna see on the screen. And this is minus 135 to positive 135. And you might be thinking to yourself, why are we bothering mapping it? Why don't we just do the I value from minus 135 to positive 135? Well, again, this is sort of future proofing, making sure that we understand the concept because we're not gonna be able to directly pass a value coming from a sensor. As I already mentioned, a fuel sensor or an O2 sensor or other sensors like a TAC, these aren't gonna just pass you nice numbers that you can just feed right in. You're gonna have to condition them in some way. Now, if you're talking about a TAC signal, that's something that is going to have to be preconditioned before it ever gets to the microcontroller because you're not gonna wanna feed it an erratic signal. You're gonna want something clean that you can feed into, uh, in this case, into the function. Now for a speed, it's a little bit easier if you're using GPS speed, you can directly pass the speed into the map function. If you're using a fuel gauge, it's gonna be a, a zero to some voltage that's gonna give you the, uh, the height of the fuel. So these are all things that are going to have to be mapped. So what we wanna do here, now that we have an angle, we're gonna plot gauge and we're gonna pass it the angle map. So what we're doing is we essentially created this I value, which is gonna go from zero to 270. And at zero, it's gonna pass minus 135 into our function, which means that the position that the needle is rotated to when it's pushed onto the gauge sprite is at minus 135, which is gonna be essentially zero on our gauge. So now that we have that, I'm gonna add a small delay in there. We don't necessarily need it, but I'm just gonna add it. And then I'm gonna use this yield function. Now, remember I talked about this in the previous video and 
the yield function is is sort of to deal with some of the ESP chipsets. And basically, if something is taking too long in the back end, this yield or this watchdog command um, allows it to continue without resetting everything. So I haven't really found that it's needed, but if there's a delay in passing a new value, if, uh, for example, you're going at consistent speed or if you're just watching the fuel gauge and it's not changing very much, there is a potential that it might think that the prog that nothing's happening and it tries to reset the program. So just keep in mind that these functions like yield, they tend to come up on the ESP chipsets, but they're not found everywhere. So now that we have this for loop, I'm gonna copy it. I'm gonna go after it and I'm gonna paste it again. I'm gonna hit backspace here just to bring this back. Now we're gonna go from uh, 270. So we're gonna start at 270. I is gonna be greater than zero. So we're gonna go all the way down to zero and this is I minus equals five. So that means that it's gonna go down five degrees starting at 270 and five degrees all the way down until it's greater than zero. Now we could do greater than or equal to, what this means is it's gonna stop at about five degrees because it's never gonna to get to zero. We could say greater than or equal to, take it all the way down to zero. Um, but just keep in mind that again, we're just sort of faking it. We're just passing it value so that we can see it rotate. So let's save this and let's upload it and let's take a look. So as we can see on the screen, everything seems to be working perfectly. The delay, we don't have sort of any, um, any issues with the transparency behind the needle. It's not wiping and it's not leaving a needle behind it. It's not erasing anything underneath. Uh, and again, it all comes down to the way in which we we set up and the order in which we create these objects. So let's just do a quick review so we can talk about next steps and we can kind of understand what's happening here. So I'm gonna add some comments in here. The swap bytes really, uh, th this happens depending on how the image is converted. So you might need to uh, let's see, you might need to use either the, the big or the little Indian byte type. Creating the needle is something that has to happen uh, in order to have the needle sprite. So we must create that needle first. It has to happen before the gauge background because we need it to plot to the gauge background. So uh, keep in mind, again, this example is nearly identical to what we did in the last video, with the main difference being the fact that we're bringing in an image converted to a byte array, and we're using that byte array. And you know, honestly, this gives you more flexibility in designing your gauges, makes it a whole lot easier to make more compelling graphics behind them. It's a lot harder to draw all this stuff. There's a lot more code involved. And as we go down, uh, take a look at some of the other options we have. I'm gonna get rid of this plot gauge in the beginning because we don't need it, just clean things up a little bit. And as we look through here, we are creating a for loop just to mimic, uh, mimic the gauge. And then we're plotting the gauge, which creates the background, and then it pushes the rotated needle. Now, an important thing to remember, at no point in time are we ever refilling the screen. In our setup, we filled the screen with white, but we're not going back through and we're not filling it with white each time. If you try to refill the gauge with white after you plot it, what you're gonna end up seeing is a bunch of flickering. So this all works without ever refilling it because we have two static sprite images. The, the needle is not changing, the background is not changing. All we're doing is we're re-pushing the needle on top of the background of the gauge. And because we're just simply repositioning it and we're not redrawing everything, it happens quick and everything is nice and smooth because we don't have to sit there and redraw everything. Now, when we take a look at our first example that we did where we were actually drawing everything, we actually had to be very mindful of erasing certain areas. We had to erase where the number was, we had to erase um, certain parts of the gauge just so that we could redraw everything. And what we ended up doing, we found that if we tried to erase little bits and pieces, there was a lot of flickering, but if we just redrew everything at the same time, 
then it worked better. But we still did have a little bit of flicker, and that just comes down to the complexity of what you're drawing on the screen. If you're drawing a lot of uh, you know different graphics on the screen, it's going to take more time. The benefit of using the sprite approach is because we draw everything in RAM, and then we push it all at once. So we don't ever have to wait for everything to get drawn. We simply just draw it in the back end and push it at once. From here, some of the things that, that I'm planning on doing with the series, now I'll be completely honest, the last video only about 100 people watched it, so I don't know how many people are actually trying to do this, but uh, the, the way that I want to keep progressing with this is to take a look at being able to select different backgrounds, being able to select different gauges. And that's gonna come down to not only just having the different speedo or tack background or fuel uh, fuel level background, we can use the same needle over and over again, but it, it's gonna come down to one, being able to read for buttons, which is gonna happen in the loop. And the button presses are going to send a different number value to, dis to determine which gauge background is gonna get pushed. So down here where we're uh, actually creating the gauge background in this, uh, this option right here, speedo white, what is gonna end up happening is we're gonna have some if else conditional statements that'll say things like if gauge number equals zero, then um, then the, this, the text value that we're gonna do is we're gonna push speedo white. If gauge value equals two, then we're gonna push tack. If it equals three, then we're gonna push fuel and, and so on. So what that's gonna allow us to do is it's gonna allow us to have a menu where the user can press a button to go up a gauge or go down a gauge and figure out which gauge they wanna display. The complexity behind that is not just about displaying a different background because that'll be easy enough, but it's gonna also take into account different mapped values. We're still gonna be going the same angle sweep, but instead of going from, let's say we were taking a speed value where we're going from zero to 50 kilometers an hour, we're gonna be taking a tack value which depending on how that value comes into the program, you're gonna be taking a look at, you know, let's say a frequency value, or if you're taking a look at voltage coming from a fuel sensor. So these are all the things that you need to consider and just changing the gauge background is the easier part, but then also figuring out which variables you want to use is gonna be a bit harder. Now you can do that a couple of different ways. You can create an array of values to map and then you would be calling the array position. And if you coordinate that array position relative to whatever gauge number you're doing, then that could possibly give you, um, could possibly give you the way forward. So for example, if all of your values stop at zero, then all the zero values can, can just be zero, but all the upper end values for mapping could be tied to the gauge number position inside of an array for those mapped values. So uh, just keep in mind that there are a ton of different ways that we can think about and configure this. Now, another thing that I mentioned very early on was instead of having the white background, we could have changed all of the white values to transparent. Now doing that means that you could potentially change the background color, which we set to TFT white. You could potentially change that to any color you want, assuming that the black text and the black speedo ring could be seen on whatever color you want. Obviously, if you made it black, then it wouldn't work, but you could then change the background to blue or green or yellow or you know something high contrast that you can see easily. Uh, so keep in mind, there are, are tons of different ways that you can sort of tweak and, and configure this. And keep in mind that we did use both the uh, LCD converter download that we looked at, and we also use the image to CPP. Now, both of these work great and they have pros and cons. There are pluses and minuses. Um, I like the LCD image converter simply for the fact that when we do the conversion, we do have the option to do the little or big byte order option, which again, when it comes down to having something where we're, we're looking at the colors not displaying right and we definitely need transparency like we have here with the needle, then we can go back and we can, uh, you know, we can do a find and replace to change all the white pixels to transparent pixels when we're using a sprite. Another thing to keep in mind is if your icon or your image has white, uh, 
then you might want to make the transparent background another color that you know isn't going to be used. So that might be a magenta or a pink or, again, something that is just outside of the color spectrum that you're going to be using. So that way, instead of converting the white pixels to a background that's transparent, you can convert those uh, teal pixels to a background that's transparent. So uh, it can give you some really great options to be able to create something that is, let's say, round on a square display, because then the background color uh, is potentially going to be what you see um, around the outside of the gauge rather than just all white, because that's what we filled. So once more, there are tons and tons of different ways that we can configure this. But the main takeaway from this video, which ended up being quite a bit longer than I expected, is that we convert our images, a bitmap, a PNG, a JPEG, to what's considered a byte array. And the byte array in this case is 16-bit, which means that our colors are represented by 0, X, and then four additional digits, whether they're uh, letters or numbers, depends on the actual color. What we're going to do is we take those values and we simply push the images onto the screen using push image. Now that can be displayed directly on your LCD or you can use sprites like we did to display it and, and actually build it in RAM in the sprite before you push it to the screen. And since we are doing this with sprites, we've got a sprite for the background and we've got a sprite for the needle. And we just simply change the angle in which the, the needle sprite is pushed onto the gauge background. This gives us a nice clean display. Uh, it's got really good graphics. And then it gives us the ability to configure it to our heart's desire. We can uh, add all kinds of different graphics to the back end. Again, this is smaller than the width of my display. So I could push it all the way to one side and display fuel and tack and other things on the left hand side. All kinds of different things that we could do. What I'd like to know is, is anybody doing this? Is anybody using this? And is there different configurations that you've had trouble with? Have you tried to do something and not, not been able to do it? As I mentioned, I am planning to continue this series. I wanna, um, I wanna help Anthony figure out how to configure the different backgrounds. I'm not sure how soon that video will come out, but uh, for this one and the previous ones, if you had any questions, if you had any problems, if you are a programmer and I said something wrong and you happen to watch this whole thing, please let me know. I want to make sure that the information is correct and we can pin the comment uh, to the top to make sure that everybody does see it. But as always, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.